It's 8.30. Do you know where your brains are? Okay, somewhere along the line, be before one begins talking about the recent flock of Vietnam movies and, and the turning of Vietnam into a commercial product, I think we should get s a working definition of militarisms, which I've dug up someplace, um, to distinguish militarism in some sense from the military. And this comes from a book called The H History of Militarism by Alfred Vatz, V-A-G-T-S. And he makes the distinction. Uh, for the military, he says, the military way is marked by a primary con concentration of men and materials on winning specific objects of power with the utmost efficiency. That's fine. It's much more interesting with militarism. Militarism, he says, on the other hand, presents a vast array of customs, interests, prestige, actions, and thought associated with armies and wars, and yet transcending, or I would say uh, not transcending, but transforming, uh, transforming true military purposes. So for my purposes, for, my, for, for this conversation or discussion today, militarism for me is, is the ideology absent uh, or free from any kind of notion of what the military ought to be. It's the, it's, it's the signs of the military without any kind of relationship to what those signs may have. For instance, the, the proliferation of camouflage underwear and pants and stuff like that. That's a militarism for me. So, if we understand that we are in an age of militarism and not in a military buildup, uh, but militarism in which we are producing these signs, which in many ways may go against or even hamper a kind of military attempt, in many, uh, many ways it often does, uh, we can begin to understand the, what these films and what all of the business of Vietnam is doing these days, which seems to me to be recuperating a lost war or recuperating a lost sense of militarism as it begins to proliferate and produce more and more signs about Vietnam, which produced more and more signs about the military, which we can, which we can appropriate. So. Okay, from there we can go to the rest of the production of the films from Platoon forward. These movies that have made a great deal of money and have changed the attitude of Hollywood and the entertainment industry around. We're talking about movies now like Platoon that are making 137 million in one year. Kubrick's film Full Metal Jacket made 56 million. So we're talking about big business. We're talking about something being transformed uh, from what it used to be, which was an, a subject that was negative. You know, you had to uh, you got kudos in Hollywood for producing a Vietnam film, say, coming and coming home, or you've got trash for producing the wrong Vietnam film, like Deer Hunter. But now it's big business, and Vietnam has been reified in, in certain ways. Okay. This is a section of the city of Coronado. Coronado is a very nice place to visit if you're ever downtown. And it is located off of Broadway. Also above the condominium, you can see some naval jets coming into North Island. It does not accommodate cars such as some of the older ferries have. Over to more tranquil Oakland. 
Ahead of the Berkeley, we have Anthony's Seafood Restaurant on the water, and ahead of this, we have the Star of India. The San Diego is often the movie, referred to like as America's finest city. Uh, it's also America's uh, finest uh, militarized uh, zone. And they say San Diego's home port for about 29% of the U.S. home fleet. And with that, those kinds During of naval Bowl institutions weekend, that we're course, seeing here in the Super harbor Bowl and the other kinds of support right facilities as well as defense Murphy industry Stadium. in San Diego make San Although, Diego one of the largest military complexes in the world according to the U.S. Uh, Navy. Next, year. next on our right here you can see a large naval installation. What? This is where the Navy commandos, assassins if you will, are trained. They're called Navy SEALs. Proves an ideal place to have an amphibious base because on this side is the harbor and just on the other side of the base is the Pacific Ocean so the Navy can conduct joint maneuvers and operations from one central point. An example of some of the things they train the Navy SEALs to do was recently illustrated to us in the Persian Gulf when the U.S. Navy took out the two Iranian oil platforms the Iranians were using to launch speedboat attacks into the lay mines. Those installations were taken out by being shelled by a five-inch gun, one of which we'll see. They also had the Navy SEALs, the commandos, underwater demolition experts, go down underneath the water and plant explosives on the structures holding up the oil platforms. So there's a very good chance, in other words, that the commandos that carried out that mission were trained right off to the right on that bit of land. Look at after Platoon, one of the major issues about reading these war movies would be what's left out. And why do I say after Platoon? Because of all the hype that this movie has around it, that this is the real image of Vietnam. If you, if you buy that, then you begin to forget certain aspects of history. What has been left out? becomes a question that doesn't cross most people's minds. They take Platoon as the thing itself, which of course makes all sorts of problems for anybody with any kind of common sense. For instance, Platoon transforms or reifies the whole notion uh, behind the phrase Vietnam War. And what do I mean by that? Quite simply, the proper noun, Vietnam, which at one time did refer to a country, now becomes an adjective that's put before the word war. Uh, we have very little sense, in some sense, in Platoon, of what Vietnam, the country, may have been. We have, of course, an idea that it's all jungle everywhere all the time, but that that's, may not be the case. You know, there might be mountains, there might be beaches. You might not have always spent all your time in the jungle. I guess we can turn now to the whole notion of, of the transformation of these films like Platoon, Full Metal Jacket, etc., into history, which I find the oddest thing in the world. These films are producing a historiography. They're producing a historiography based upon the accuracy of costuming at some point along the line. Uh, Hollywood is producing uh, a, a notion of history as being full. The things that I noticed going point, through here is the juxtaposition the between the, the, the beauty of the sky, bay, the tourist attractions, people to have a good time, party. and then and you're you hearing about the where these ships have been, and we're really talking about American power projection into the, into the Persian Gulf, position. into the Pacific Ocean, is and this is just I mean, a very concrete graphic launcher. example of it. If you look on the Ranger just below the flight deck there, you'll be able to see some pill-shaped gray objects. Those are inflatable life rafts. Then up towards the front of the ship, a singular white pill-shaped object. That is a phalanx cannon defense system. Systems can fire 3,000 rounds a minute, which equals about 50 bullets a second. 
They're designed to work similar to a Gatlin gun in the sense that they shoot out a sheet or wall of metal that is supposed to detract or destroy any incoming missiles or planes aimed at the ship. And that is a last ditch defense system and it is the same system that failed aboard the USS Stark when two supposedly mistaken Iraqi Exocet missiles blasted through the side of the frigate resulting in a loss of 37 of our U.S. sailors. Well, you know, as a peace activist, I'm a staff person for an organization. I deal with these issues every day. And I'm constantly talking with people about issues related to nuclear war, social justice, intervention. And yet, to me, even the impact that it had on me to go down and take the harbor tour and to hear this, this constant saying, well, yes, this ship is just back from the Middle East. Yes, this was in the Persian Gulf. I was, my mind was boggled to realize the connection between San Diego and what's going on in the Persian Gulf. One of the things but that's very difficult in San Diego is to get the peace anyway, movement we'll to, to deal ship, with the whole issue like of the ships in the harbor blasted. and what the Navy, Navy is actually is doing. And this is, off to the right I think, the because the of Linda. The, the fear that people have of yeah. beginning to deal concretely with the issues. It's very easy to talk abstractly about arms control. It's very easy to talk about nuclear war. But when you get down to talking about what's in your own back backyard, then people have to deal with issues of employment. They have to talk to their neighbors and friends who might be employed in those industries. And in San Diego, we have a situation where about one in every five jobs is defense dependent. And there's a lot of fear at attached to that, that figure. Ship, a lot of people are afraid that if they begin to talk about arms control and actual disarmament well in, in San Diego, that this you're talking about here, taking people's jobs away, on the front so they don't want to touch it. stars on the blue background is U.S. naval ship HHS. By looking up the stack and see People join the Navy to get away from small towns and dead-end jobs. High unemployment provides the military with fresh young women and men who need jobs. Local San Diego schools sell the names, addresses, and phone numbers of students to military recruiters. Parents must request the school district not to release the name of their children. 89% of people who've done military service have found their training to be useless in finding a civilian job. The military recruitment budget for 1986-87 was $1.7 billion. It's your Navy. It's your Navy. John, I want you to know that I did what I could to keep you out of here. Yeah. Sir, did we get the win this time? Now before we get on to that, back to, back to the biggest absence in the movie, and that's the presence of any kind of Vietnamese or Vietnamese culture. But immediately you go, nah. Nah, there's, there's Vietnamese in the movie. I saw Vietnamese in the movie. I saw the bad sergeant blow somebody away. There's Vietnamese there. I mean, they walked into a village, for Christ's sake. And then, of course, we won't count the bad guys from them. But they walked into a vill. Yeah, you saw pictures of Vietnamese. But what did you see? I mean, it seems to me that what you saw was in the was that image that we like to project over the top of the Vietnamese, which is number one, the eternal vill, right? The eternal peasant, the person living close to the ground and has been there for centuries. You also saw the Vietnamese represented as they usually are, the Vietnamese people, as either the old, the infirmed, or the young and the innocent. Uh, when they are 
portrayed as, as, as males of a particular kind of virility, then they become the bad guys at some point along the line. So most Vietnamese, when you see them in movies, especially after Platoon, not before it, I mean, there's some changes before it. Most of the Vietnamese, you see them, they live in, in these peasant uh, villes. Uh, they look like pig farmers, and for the most part, our heart goes out to these poor, ignorant farmers. And that, in the truest sense, is the spirit of America. The more we understand it, the more we honor those who kept it alive. I'm Lee Iacocca. So, so that seems to me to be one of the things that, that's missing out of these movies and one of the things that becomes terribly important when you start producing not just a film that's a memoir but a film that you're passing off as that's the way it really was. Right? Although when you say that there's two responses you can have to the film. You can have a very naive response and go, okay, now that I have the way it was, good, I can go home. Or that very phrase opens up the possibility of criticism in an amazing way. If you can produce an image of that's the way it really was, then you can begin to sit there and, and discover maybe some of our failings as an imperialist power at some point along the line. But nobody does that. that, that they usually kind of avoid that, that aspect of this, this, this realism. Anyway. This Jeep is a museum piece, a relic of war. Normandy, Anzio, Guadalcanal, Korea, Vietnam. I hope I we will never have, have to build another, another Jeep, Jeep for war. war. This film, Platoon, is a memorial, not to war, but to all the men and women who fought in a time and in a place nobody really understood, who knew only, only one, one thing. thing. They were called, and they went. It was the same from the first musket fired at Concord to the rice paddies of the Mekong Delta. They, they were, were called, called and then they went. went. That, in the truest sense, is the spirit of America. The more we understand it, the more we honor those who kept it alive. I'm Lee, I'm Lee Iacocca. Iacocca. Uh, up until about two or three years ago, you couldn't ask an audience uh, were there women in Vietnam and get the response, yes. The amazing thing has happened to the way the women were silenced for over a 15 or 20 year period of time. These women, these nurses who worked in the hospitals 48 hours a day who would suffer through the, the, the carnage that would come in. They came back to the United States Many of them changed in very drastic ways. And in a couple of years began to suffer the same kinds of trauma as the veterans. And they would go to the hospital or they would go to a psychiatrist and they would speak to the psychiatrist and, and, and they would get responses like, well, you can't be suffering from this. You never saw combat. The third thing that seems to be missing from these films, and this seems to be uh, directly repressed, and that is the anti-war vet. Uh, if you've seen Hamburger Hill, you will see exactly the opposite coming out. What's being produced now is our movies, situated in this, quote, real mode, which is inherited from Platoon, which gives the grunt a great deal of authority, like Hamburger Hill, in which the, which the infantrymen are speaking out against the peaceniks, the freaks back home. The, the, the separation between the two, the military and the anti-war movement in the United States, is being articulated in these films in very interesting ways. So that students of mine who come into my classes who know absolutely nothing about Vietnam but what the media has given them and end up producing their own representations of the war, begin to talk about the anti-war movement, uh, those draft dodgers, uh, those people who didn't go. They don't understand that the anti-war movement in some sense was not 
<laughs> was not the cause for the veterans being alienated from society in some sense, although those stories about veterans being spit on and shit thrown at them when they got off at airports are both true and not true. But those stories also have a tendency to split the veteran, the person who fought the war, from those who fought against the war. Uh, in fact, both sides were fighting the war, as the case may be. You know, one just wants to say, okay. That, that gives people who watch these films, quote, that are real, the, the, the notion that there was no, there were no veterans or people in the military who had any kind of political consciousness whatsoever or who tried to protest the war themselves. That kind of subverting of, of, of the of the anti-war sentiment or the political consciousness of the, of, of the soldier during the war is what's being repressed in these movies and what has to be recuperated now. It seems to me to be the most important thing that, that, that historians can do as you dig down underneath this thing. There were anti-war uh, veterans. There were people who refused to fight in the war and were locked up. There were um, there were mutinies. Uh, there were riots. There were two brig riots, as far that I know of, that took place in uh, Vietnam. Uh, fraggings, that, that, that brutal thing where, where soldiers assassinated their officers. Notice the wordings. Fragging soldiers assassinated their officers. Could be understood as mutinies. Uh, people refusing to go out and fight in this war. So you have this anti, these anti-war veterans. You have the veterans who walked off the field in Nam and went AWOL. They just caught one in Australia who's been gone for 14 or 15 years. Uh, you had people who refused to go to Nam and were locked up in brigs in the United States. And there's a man by the name of Short who's now collecting pictures of these people who refused to go. But this has all been repressed in many ways by, by the image of the war. Uh, even the political intelligence of, of certain kinds of, of fighters or, or people uh, in the war is being repressed, as if we were all drafted and went over there in a naive, patriotic attitude. This is not the case. One of the things that, that we do know, and it is coming to light or being articulated when veterans speak, you can begin to talk about it as a class war. It was the exploited, in some sense, fighting the, ex the exploited. Uh, these were people from various neighborhoods, various kinds of backgrounds in the United States who had very little option at some point along the line other than to be patriotic. But that does not necessarily mean that they were not political that they did not recognize what Nam was about or what they were doing there. They may not have known the politics of Vietnam, but they sure as hell began to recognize the politics of being a poor boy and looking around for somebody else over there. And, it, and it's naive, it seems to me, to, to ignore the possibility or the fact that the black civil rights movement was going on in the United States while blacks were being drafted out of those street corners and put into Vietnam without some sort of recognition that the political consciousness that is going on in the street may as well be going on in the army at that period of time. Mamba is a fast attack copter with laser guns and missiles on both sides. There's a persuader attack! The Mamba holds three Cobras and the sides detached to become separate attack pods. Triple threat, meet yet, Cobra Mamba! Cobra! Yo, Joe! G.I. American hero! In 1987, G.I. Joe was the top-selling war toy in the United States. As a matter of fact, it was the top-selling toy. Uh, this is pretty incredible if you think back to the Vietnam period when G.I. Joe dolls were very prevalent and there was quite a campaign against them because people were very sickened by the images of people being killed in Vietnam every night on their television and they saw very clearly the connection between the kind of toys and play that children were engaged in and the war that was going on. So the sales of G.I. Joe dolls decreased and uh, G.I. Joe was finally discontinued by Hasbro because he only made six million dollars in 1976. Well Hasbro brought him back uh, a year or two ago and now, as I said, he is the number one top-selling toy. And we have to ask ourselves, why is this happening now at a time when we're, we're 
in a country that has a very aggressive foreign policy, why is this the top selling toy? Why are children clamoring after the G.I. Joe doll? And it's not even just the doll, it's all the accessories that go along with, with G.I. Joe and the cartoon programming. Uh, I think this is something we need to think very seriously about. Listen to some of the packaging that is on some of the war toys. One toy called Shockwave has a cold, brutal, scientific approach to war. Bone Crushers packaging reads, hit it till it stands no taller than dust. Creates fear and terror. Rebel Stream Wasteland is his idea of beauty. Soundwave, cries and screams are music to my ears. Hook, who strives for perspective perfection, even if others have to suffer. And finally, ransack. The sight of ruin only makes me crave more. Right. What's the one thing that we can all do and we'll have peace tomorrow? Right. <laughs> it, it's, it's, the more I work, the more I see that it's, it's going to take a lot longer than we thought. And the question is always, how much time do you really have? Um, we have to deal with the concrete issues, the concrete political issues that are confronting us, something has to be done to stop those. But I think we're talking about longer term changes in society. What is happening to people who are constantly being saturated with these kinds of militaristic issues, who accept the fact that we have 300 nuclear weapons sitting down in San Diego Harbor, who think nothing of their kids watching these television programs where the conflicts are always solved by violence, who think nothing that the ships are going out um, to the Persian Gulf, who think nothing of having recruiters on their kids' high school campus every day. They don't, they don't think about it. It just becomes a, a very usual thing. And what you have to say is, as a society, what we are allowing as normal has to change, I think, before we can solve any of the bigger political problems. Anti-submarine warfare, and there is also a nuclear weapons facility here, which in other words means we do store nuclear weapons here on North Island. There we go. Let's, let's begin at the end with a question. It seems to me that most of our films and most of our popular culture about Vietnam begins in some way with a question. And that question seems to be, why were we in Vietnam? A question I find, like Heidegger, to already suggest its end. And, and it also suggests the way in which we think about Nam. Because if we ask why we were in Vietnam, we turn back on ourselves. We keep looking at our culture. It seems to me that the war in Vietnam should force us to think of another question. And I think that other question should be something like, why aren't we in Vietnam now? Which changes the whole focus. We have to start thinking about the other in a different way. We have to start thinking about that country, Vietnam, and its win and our loss in a different way. So maybe we can begin at the end and say, this has all been generated by that question uh, that the movies never seem to address. Why aren't we in Vietnam now? about the tragedy center on why the highly sophisticated Aegis radar system on the ship was unable to differentiate between a wide-bodied airliner and a sleek jet fighter. President Questions about the tragedy center on why the highly sophisticated Aegis radar system on the ship was unable to differentiate between a wide-bodied airliner and a sleek jet fighter.